Hi, my name's Nicola. I'm uh, a web developer. I work at uh, Nudge. So Nudge is a digital agency based in Bristol. So we've got our offices over in Desk Lodge and we are a Drupal agency. I've been working at Nudge for the past five months and I've also been a web developer for the past five months. This is because <laughs> I can see some people laughing because they know why. Um, last summer, I decided to change career. So I used to work in marketing. I used to be a marketer and a copywriter. Um, and I decided to undertake a three month coding bootcamp run by a company called Develop Me down in the paintworks. And Nudge were kind enough to hire me straight from that course. And I have been working there ever since. Um, so I'm going to talk to you tonight about the first project that I ever worked on at Nudge, first project actually ever worked on as a developer. And I was pretty lucky with the project that it was. So a lot of the work that we do at Nudge is um, Drupal backend, Drupal front end in the same application. Um, and I ended up being on a project which had a headless Drupal backend and a decoupled React front end. So it was the first project. It was a bit of a, bit of a learning curve, uh, but it was a great one to be involved with, which is why I decided to talk about it tonight. OK, so Drupal. Um, who here is familiar with Drupal? Ah, great. OK, who here works with Drupal? OK, so I assume you are not doing the updates yet, if you are here. Uh, <laughs> OK, so for those of you who are not so familiar with it, um, I am going to be talking about it. The broader context of this talk is just CMSs in general, but this project focuses on Drupal. So I'll just explain to you a little bit about what it is um, so that you have a bit more context. So Drupal itself is an open source and free CMS. And it's really good at um, structuring content for content driven websites. Um, and actually what you're able to do on the back end of that is have some quite complex data structures. And you're also able to access that information quite easily with the way it's structured. Um, so the way, that it's, the way that Drupal does this, the way that Drupal makes it quite easy is that it has this idea of nodes. And within these nodes, we can set fields. Once we've got that, actually, it makes it quite easy for us to organize our content. And when we then think about expanding this and thinking about taxonomy terms, thinking about menus, actually, what we have now is quite an efficient way of structuring, but also a way of filtering our content within the back end. So Drupal 8, which is the version that I'm predominantly going to be talking about tonight, it comes with um, support for exposing the entities like nodes, like users, like comments. This is through its RESTful API service. So already out of the box, we've got a lot of possibilities with exposing that data from Drupal 8's backend. If we want to go a little bit deeper, and we might want to do that if we're being a bit more custom with what we're doing, we've then got entity field and form APIs which again, it makes managing that content in Drupal quite a pleasurable experience for us. So as a CMS, uh, Drupal is designed to be flexible and extensible. And this is due to the modular approach that it takes. So what you're getting with Drupal is you're getting the building blocks to build your CMS system. And then you decide how you want to piece those together. So you've got the toolkit, you build it how you need to build it. The other side of this is going to be React. Um, so anyone work with React? Yeah, more hands. That's what I was thinking. Uh, OK, so with React then, so it's a declarative, efficient, um, and flexible JavaScript library for building user interfaces. So for me, there are three main selling points of React. And there were three aspects of it which became quite apparent during development, things that really helped us as we were building these apps. I'll go into these a little bit. So first is the lightweight virtual DOM, which allows it to be performant and quite fast. Second is being component-based, so we're able to scale our apps if we want to. And then the last one is the unidirectional data flow, and I'm going to be talking about that in the context of debugging. So the first one. So thinking about um, updating the DOM. So when we update the DOM, it's normally quite an expensive process, but React is able to mitigate this um, by actually creating a clone. So it clones the real DOM. This is what is referred to as the virtual DOM. So the process that happens here, so when I want to uh, change an element and re-render it out, what React is doing is it's updating all of the nodes in the virtual DOM. It's then performing a diff operation. So it's looking at the DOM in its new state, comparing it with the DOM from the previous state, finding out what's changed, and then it makes those changes in the real DOM. So actually, what this allows is for it to be quite lightweight, quite fast. It can batch those operations, so it's speedy. Um, and this is quite a contrast to working with Drupal. I just say I love working with Drupal, but it has got its um, 
hmm, fallbacks? <laughs> I don't know how to describe this. Um, so when you're thinking then about a monolithic Drupal build, so this is where you've got back-end in Drupal, front-end in Drupal, and it's part of the same application. So they are intrinsically linked together. They're not separate things at all. When we're thinking then about um, speed in this kind of context, Drupal's not necessarily a fast performer. So you've got quite a large code base with Drupal. Um, you've also got a little bit of bloat there because Drupal is so flexible. You have got so many things in your toolkit, but you're never going to use them all. So if you kind of think about maybe using about 40% of what you've got available, you've still got all that other functionality that's just waiting there until you need to pull it out. So it's a little bit slower by nature. Components. So React is uh, essentially a component library. So this allows you to break down your user interface into composable pieces. And the granularity of that really depends on what you're building and what structure is going to suit that particular project. I'm just going to show um, a really, really basic overview of a, of a React app, um, kind of to put it into context with how this could be scaled. So sitting at the top of this then, and it is a hierarchical structure, I have got my main app container. So this is where my UI is going to be rendered from. This is pulling everything into it. So sitting underneath my app, I might have some parent components. And these are essentially wrappers. So these are um, probably including a little bit of logic. They might be pulling in data from API calls. And they're feeding all of that down into essentially what we could call dumb components. So these are just pure UI. They don't contain logic. All they do is take data and provide the tools for that app at the top to render it out. So what we've got here then when we're looking at those dumb components at the bottom is, depending on how we built it, hopefully we've built it with the notion of scaling it up we've hopefully got reusable components. So this means when we want to adapt it, when we want to change it, when we want to make this bigger, it's easy for us to do because we've already done the work. It's there waiting for us. Comparing this then to the Drupal build, if we are looking at um, doing the same kind of thing with Drupal in terms of scaling it up, it's not quite as quick. It's not quite as easy. We might have to think there a little bit about structure in Drupal and the configuration of how we've got it working because we have got that back end bolted onto the front end they're not decoupled in any way. They're completely linked. A little bit more tricky. So the last one, the unidirectional data flow. So I said I was talking about this in the context of debugging. So we've got these dumb components sitting at the bottom. They need to get their data from somewhere. And that data is going to come down from the top. So we've got this unidirectional data flow. It's always going top down. And it's being passed through by something called props. So when we're thinking then about debugging, what this is enabling us to do is, first of all, we know where our state is going. So inside this React app, we have a notion of state. This is anything that we're changing. And we also know when we're changing it because we're calling a set state function. So when something goes wrong in my app, I already know where the state's coming from. I already know where I've modified it. So I've got a bit of a head start in working out where it is. I also know where it's not going to be because I know it's going downwards. Thinking then about debugging with Drupal, uh, not quite so straightforward. So we've got various PHP things we can do. We've got kints, which we can print out all of our variables in Drupal. So we can kind of work out what's going on with that. We can also debug our theme templates. Um, but essentially, we are going to have to go to a few more places to try and debug exactly what is going on there. So those are the three main points with React and why it was a great experience working with it. OK. So I'm going to be talking about a headless CMS, which I'm sure you've probably heard this term at some point. Um, I'm just going to contextualize it. So this is exactly what I mean when I say headless. <coughs> so I want you to imagine that you are uh, going into a shop. You're maybe interacting with products. You are browsing. You're maybe picking them up, having a good look at them. And you might even interact with one of the store assistants there. But there's one part of that store that you are never interacting with, and that's the storeroom at the back. That's the thing that's containing all of the data. It's actually facilitating that store actually being there and running and operating. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about headless CMS, but a little bit more separated. So it's that data store. It's the content repository that is um, sitting at the back. It doesn't have a natural front end bolted onto it, uh, which means that if we want to then expose that data, we're going to have to think about using an API to access it. So if we're using Drupal, we're using purely the back end. We've got an admin interface on it. We need to use the API to access any of that data because our front end is not connected to Drupal. 
Um, this means then that for our users, they are interacting with our framework. They're not interacting with Drupal. And what this means for us as developers is that we are able to build immersive experiences, modern front end experiences that users are wanting, that users are accustomed to. And it also means if we are working with a CMS, we're not forcing that CMS to do something that it's not designed to do. We're choosing the best tooling for the job. Okay, so at Nudge, um, we're quite excited about headless technology. Um, I'm quite excited about it as well, so I'm going to drive this point home and hopefully by the end, you're all going to be excited about it too um, and think about exploring it in some more ways. So, reasons why it is exciting. There's more than this, but I've just picked my top three. So, first of those is that if we are using um, our CMS as a data store, it means that we're able to take a, a more service oriented approach to how we're architecting things on the back end. And what this is meaning is that um, we're able to actually break down our services so we can distill them down and we can kind of pull them out, maybe even their subcomponents. And what we're able to do once we get into that way of thinking is that we're able to pull out quite individual experiences for our users. And we're all able to do this with, with one CMS. So you have one backend, and we're able to pull out all of these different services. So when you've got a single, front, uh, a single CMS on the back end, that can serve multiple front ends. Um, and the platforms that you choose on those front ends, that's totally up to you. So it could be frameworks, um, or if you're thinking about the Internet of Things, it could be anything. So your possibilities here are endless. You've got the data, you've got the API. It's your choice now what you choose to do with that and how you display it. There are a few benefits then to this idea of decoupling. So decoupling is the idea of complete separation. So when you've got a headless CMS, you've decoupled the back end. OK, they're not connected at all. Uh, so benefits that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first one is that um, you are able to make changes on the back end or on the front end completely independently of the other end. So, for example, um, if I need to make a change on the back end of my website, so I need to go, uh, sorry, my app, I need to go into Drupal, I make my change, and as long as my data is still available in the way it needs to be available, my front end will never, ever know. And I don't have to change it at all. And then vice versa, if I want to change the theming of my app or I want to make a UX change, Again, as long as I'm still using the data in the right way, I can do it. And the backend's never going to know. I don't have to do anything with it. So they're completely independent of each other. What this also means is that when we're thinking about uh, choosing the best technology for the job, we might decide down the line that we actually want to change the technology. So we've got React apps that we've built in Nudge. A couple of years down the line, we might want to change that. We might want to use a different framework on the front end. And we can. As long as we are still interacting with that API in exactly the same way, we can change it. We can plug out React. We can plug in a new app. Likewise, on the back end, as long as we're still using the API in the right way, giving it the right data in the right format at the right time, plug out the Drupal, put something else on the back end. So again, we've got versatility on both sides of this. Um, the final point here, we'll put focus tooling and simultaneous development. So what I'm talking about here is that we've got two technologies then. So for us, Drupal, React. This gives us then the possibility of having really strong developers working on both sides of it, rather than a couple of developers working full stack and maybe being a little less confident with React, a little more confident with Drupal. Um, and what we're doing there is we're allowing ourselves to have the best possible product at the end of it, best possible interaction and uh, experience for our users at the end, which it's all for them really. So we might as well make it the best that we can make it. With them being independent of each other, it also means that these two developers are able to work simultaneously. So they're not having to wait for each other to catch up. They can actually just plow ahead with their own development. Um, and we'll have a little look later at actually how that works in practice. Uh, so. Yeah, I live to tell the tale, so I got through it. Um, it's still kind of going, but most of it's done. So um, this has come from a project that we did at, um, at Nudge, and it was extending an existing Drupal build. So there was an existing um, Drupal website. So it was a Drupal backend, Drupal front end, joined together, same application. And uh, this website was um, it's a room booking website. So the basic functionality uh, that we're working with here is the ability to search for a meeting room, to um, book a meeting room for a specified duration at a specified time, 
to add on extras if you wanted to, and then to email out the meeting details to attendees. So that is what we're working with. And we are now thinking about distilling some of those services and extending them in our apps. And we had two apps that we needed to build. So the first of those was a room service app. So this was an application that would be on an iPad. It's a web app. It would sit inside the room um, and it would collect data from the user as to what they wanted, so food and drink. It would then send that data to the CMS. It would scurry around a bit, look for the reception details of that venue, send it back to the reception. They can then deliver the order to the room. Second app, which is the app that I was working on, uh, was a quick book app. So this is the one that most directly extended that booking functionality of the website. Um, and this was an on the door app. So it would be on the door or next to the door of the meeting room. So everyone would have one of these. Um, and the kind of process for this one was that it needed to retrieve the latest booking data as soon as the user interacted with it. They needed to then collect the details of that particular booking, what time they wanted to do it, how long they wanted it for. Um, it then needed to send that back to the CMS, log it in there, and then show a visual success or failure notice to the user. And with this app, this app is existing in a public space. Um, so we're not, we didn't build it with the idea of any long-term user sessions. So that kind of side of things wasn't really a concern for us when we were building this. Um, we had some requirements. So the requirements of these apps was that they were lightweight, uh, that they were quick, and they were optimized for iPad. And this is what led us to choose React. Uh, we had another criteria, which was that it needed to use the existing data. And that's why we went down the route of headless CMS. So there's no point reinventing the wheel. We have all the data there. We just need to try and get it out and use it. So uh, this was the first time at Nudge that we had done a project like this. So it's the first time we had decoupled Drupal and bolted on React onto the front end of it. So that naturally meant that we needed to have a bit of a think about the relationship and the communication structure between these two ends. Our React apps then were pure UI. So they would need to use API calls to get the data out of Drupal. And in order for us to be able to actually design these apps, because when you think about it like that, the apps are really designed around the data. They're really tailored to what they're going to receive. In order to be able to do that design process, we needed to know what the data was that we were going to get and when we were going to get it so we knew exactly the structure of what we were building. So I'm going to give you a little overview of the basic uh, structure of this app in terms of the communication between React app and API. So over on the right hand side, this is my React app. Right, left. On the left hand side, we've got my headless CMS and we've got the Drupal 8 API which is sitting with it. So in this instance, the API is bolted onto the React uh, CMS. So before a user even interacts with this app, we want to have a visual signifier of exactly which room we're talking about on the screen. So we're going to make an initial API call. This is going to collect the room name. This is now the app in its static state. So as soon as it's initialized, it gets the room name and it sits and it waits. And that is all it does until a user interacts. We then know that there are a few uh, bits of data that we're going to need in order for them to book. Um, any kind of room. So the first of those is that we know we're going to have to get the time slots. So we need to know when the room is available. So that's one of the API calls we're going to have to make right at the beginning. We also know they're booking a room, they're going to need to know price. So we know there's going to have to be an API call to calculate that and to show it back to the user. Within this system, people can only book rooms if they are already registered within this booking system. So there's going to have to be some verification that goes on to check that they are actually already in our CMS. So we've got a user verification API call. And then the last one that we know we definitely need is we need a booking confirmation. We need to know that it's been logged in the CMS. We need to show the user that. There's also some additional features that we want to add on to this. So now we have to start thinking about what calls we're going to need for those and actually when we're going to fit them in. So the first of those is that we want to be able to show our users if they can quick book the room. So we want to have a visual tag which shows if it's available right at this minute or if it is not available right now. So we're going to have to check for the availability at the time that someone has interacted with the app. It's another call. Linked to this, we also want to be able to show the user which other rooms in the same venue also have a quick book. So we're going to run this available now call, but we're going to run it across the different, venue, uh, across the different rooms in the same venue so that the user can have a look at that uh, and decide if they want to go for that room or a different room. Th 
then the last one that we know we're going to want is users can book now and they can book for today, but they can also book seven days in the future. So if they choose to book next Wednesday, we're going to have to renew our time slots call with that new date passed into it so that they've got accurate booking data of when they can book next Wednesday. So this is the basic communication structure, and these are our API calls. And later, um, I'll show you the app, I'll show you the API calls, and this will all make more sense once you've got a bit of context. I hope, I hope it makes more sense. Um, all right, so uh, thinking about the experience then of actually going through this. So um, when I was building the app, um, I was uh, two weeks into being a web developer, and I had really limited knowledge of Drupal. So if anyone who knows Drupal, there's a pretty steep learning curve. Uh, so I was terrified because I was thinking, oh my god, OK, not only am I going to have to build a React app, and I've only had three weeks of training, I'm now going to have to do stuff with Drupal, and I've got no idea what's going on here. What was brilliant? I didn't have to know anything about Drupal. So I was purely working on the front end. It was decoupled. So I was working on my own independently. And this worked really, really well with the other developer who was also working on the project, because he was working more on the back end. What this enabled us to do was we were able to go pretty quick with our developments. And to kind of give you a bit more context with this, so I was working on my own on this quick book app. My development speed, bearing in mind, I'm quite new to this, was considerably quicker than the other developer who was working full stack. He was developing the room service app as well as working back end on the Drupal CMS. So when you've decoupled, suddenly your speed gets a lot quicker when you are working, developing on one, one specific side. Um, there was obviously the issue with this app only being UI. And obviously, I needed some data, which you've just seen from that communication structure. So what was really beneficial during this stage was that we had got this idea of how they were communicating and what API calls were being made. Um, and we also had decided what format that data was going to be coming to the React apps in. So we decided on JSON objects. It meant that I was able to build the app with mock data. So we put some fake data in. I was able to build it start to finish. And then when we got to the end and we actually plugged in the real API calls, it was all a pretty seamless transition because those React apps already knew when the calls were going to happen, what data was going to come back, and also what the format of that data was. So it was, all, it was a pretty slick operation um, working with those. There's another aspect to this, which is the flexibility and the freedom of decoupling. So working um, on a decoupled front end gave me total flexibility with the markup. So no longer was I tied to how a CMS wants to render out the front end. All of a sudden, I have complete control over what I'm putting on that page. Um, and I also have complete control of the structure and the hierarchy within my React app, which gives me a huge amount of flexibility when we're thinking about scaling it up. So I've already got the foresight of thinking, if we want to add in features, what's the best way for me to build this app so I can future-proof it as much as possible? This also gives um, the ability then to have a very clean, a very efficient front-end app. Also, potentially, the option to have um, no redundant code or no excess. Nothing there that you don't actually need. Ultimately, what this is translating to um, is that when you've got that flexibility on the front end, you're able to create some really beautiful experiences. And these can be for any platform, because it's up to you. It's up to you how you build it um, and how you architect it as well. OK, so I kind of talked a lot about Drupal, headless CMS, and React app in isolation. But obviously, there's kind of a handshake that's going on between them. They've got to get information somehow. So when we're then thinking about um, tapping in to that, that content repository in the headless CMS, um, we've got an API. So working with Drupal 8, and there's a reason why I focused on Drupal 8, um, is that creating the endpoints for those API uh, calls is, is really, really straightforward. Can't emphasize enough how straightforward it is with Drupal 8. Um, that is because in Drupal 8, in core, you have got two modules to do this. You have got one, which is your RESTful API web services. And you've got another module, which is your admin user interface, allowing you to control that mm, from a fairly pretty view, actually, if you're used to doing it in code. Um, contrast this to Drupal 7. So Drupal 7 doesn't have it built into core. So if you are looking at doing a headless CMS, you've got to go out and get your modules and configure them yourselves. It's possible. Uh, it's just a little bit quicker and easier with Drupal 8. Um, and actually, when you're using these modules, 
it's entirely possible then to go from a fresh Drupal install to making an API call literally within minutes. It's that simple to get started. So this is kind of what part of the user interface looks like when we're working with Drupal. Um, so when we are working with our, our API calls, setting up our endpoints, we are able to specify the verbs that we want to be allowed with any specific resource. Um, we're also able to specify the formats. So you can kind of see here, I've got these formats. So JSON and XML, they come inbuilt into core. And I think if you want this little guy here, I think you have to download a module. Um, but essentially, we've, we've already got control over how we are presenting this data. We're also able here to specify our authentication. So if we need to think about cookies and about user sessions, we're able to do that um, right through our UI. Um, and essentially, what we've got here is we've got a, a really user-friendly way to interact with our API and to modify things. So we can actually build a functioning API just through this, just through the UI. Um, if we want to go a bit more custom, if we want to add a bit more functionality, which we probably will want to do at some point, we can then do that in the code. Okay, we can do it in the code and it will appear here. So actually, those examples that I've got there are kind of more custom calls on the left-hand side. Okay, so this, this is the exciting bit and I really hope this works. Um, so, I am going to demo the app um, so you can actually see it. What I've got here is, so this is the app just sitting here, this one with the grey background and this is iPad view. So this is actually what it will look like. On the left hand side, um, I've got my console. And so what I've done for this recording is every time an API call is made, I've added a console log message. So you can see when it's made and when the response is received. So you'll be able to actually see exactly when this app is interacting with my headless CMS and when it's actually not interacting at all and it's just using the data that it's collected. All right, so this is the app in its static state. So what I'm indicating there at the top that's the room title API call that's already been made and this is now sitting here. It's waiting for a user to interact with it. So that's what I'm gonna do. As soon as I click into it then, I've got three API calls that have been triggered. So this is getting the initial information to start my app up, to give the user essentially something to do. Um, the most prominent of those is this timeline. So these are the available times that the user is available to book. If you click on one, it then shows you the possible duration. So this data has come back with the time slots. There's also the feature then to book seven days in advance. So if I select next Wednesday, it's going to redo that time slots call. So you see that on the left. OK, we've done it. We've got a new updated timeline. Now we can see that some of these times are grayed out. It's because they're not available on Wednesday. And if I go ahead and I choose a different time, we can see some of those durations are also not available. So it's updated this, and this would keep going if you kept changing the date every time a new call. So I'm going back to today. Uh, okay, so there's this uh, indicator then in the header. So this is what I was talking about with the QuickBook. So that says currently available. If it wasn't, it would be greyed out and it would say not currently available. And then these are the other rooms in that venue, which I could potentially book if I wanted to. So they also have a QuickBook feature. Okay. If I then decide to book my room now, so I get my possible durations, uh, Slack message, I didn't turn that off when I did this, that was smart. Um, so I've got this and then we've got a few things happening now. So we immediately had an API call for the price. This is rendered out here, that comes from our back end. And now I'm gonna try and book it. So what we're gonna see happen now is we've got credentials verification that show that I am actually a user in the system. We can see here that the response has come back saying true, so we know I am. If that came back false, we'd be presented with a, a failure message saying that you are not registered in the system. Please contact your administrator. Um, once we've got that true, I can then send that into the booking system. And then again, I'm waiting for the response. So you can see here, I've got a true response, which means I've got my success message. If it was a false, I'd have a, whoops, there's an error. Your booking hasn't been made. Um, so hopefully this gives a bit more context with how it's working with the API calls and how it's actually getting its data. And now, uh, hey, perfect, okay. No, not okay. Oh, oh, nope, still not okay. No, yes, okay, great. Um, okay, so 
thinking about then extensibility. So with this particular project, we obviously only had two React apps, but there's actually nothing stopping us from adding three or adding four. We can extend this as many times as we want in as many different directions as we want. Um, and there's actually nothing tying us to using React either. So we could choose to use a different framework. And that's really where this starts to become a really powerful way to build things because it's so extensible. We can do whatever we want with that data. We can take it in any direction. And we could do it on any platform. And we can have as many front ends as we want because those front ends, they're completely unaware of each other. So what it allows is that um, essentially they can be super lightweight. Um, they're just dumb clients. So they're rendering the data that they're getting, which allows us to have these performant apps as well, sitting on the front end of what could be quite a complex structure, uh, complexly, no, it's not a word, complex structure, nah. complex back end, okay, with a lot of content and a lot of different um, structures going on. And we're also not just confined to JavaScript frameworks. Obviously, I've talked about React today, um, but a little example. So this here is my lovely CMS, it's headless, it's my room booking CMS, and I decide that I want to extend it out into a few apps. So, OK, I'm going to have an Angular app. Uh, I'm probably going to choose to have a view. Why not? And I'm also going to have a React app. So I'm, I'm super skilled right now. I can do Drupal. I can do all of those. It's great for five months. Um, I'm at this point. There is absolutely nothing stopping me <coughs> from taking this in a completely different direction. Say, for example, a smart fridge. I've got the data available. I've got the API set up, I could get that data and I could show that day's meetings on the office fridge. I don't know why I'd want to, but I could do it if I wanted to do it. That's quite how extensible and how flexible this idea is of headless CMSs. OK, so final slides that I'm going to talk about. Um, these are a few takeaways. So it was the first time we'd done this. Naturally, things came out of that that we would do differently if we were going to, re if we were going to redo this. Um, there are also things that if, if you are thinking of exploring this, that um, please don't make the same mistakes, essentially, as the mistakes that I made. Uh, so my pain, your gain. Uh, first of those is this idea of resourcing. So I talked about decoupling as being a really positive thing because I said you can have experts working on both ends and they can work independently and it's super quick and it's great. Problem is, if you don't have those experts, how are you going to build these things? So you've got to make sure that you've got that resourcing in place or that you can get that resourcing if you're going to do this. So our apps were built with me doing one of them and with uh, another developer who was learning React on the job. So as he was going, he was learning and he was modifying. The result of this is that we had a hell of a lot of struggles along the way of building these. Um, and some of the code is perhaps more clunky than we would like it. And in fact, now when I look back at the app, I think, oh my god, what was I doing? That's definitely not the best way to do this. And want to naturally refactor the whole thing, which is probably not going to happen. Um, it also has a, an impact on maintenance. So if you've got clunky code, that ongoing maintenance is going to become a bit more cumbersome, going to become a bit more difficult. Plus, if your React developers leave the agency, who's going to maintain it? Who's going to maintain that technology? You need to make sure you've got that resourcing there. Uh, the second of these takeaways is to ensure that you are choosing the best technology and the right tooling for the job. So for us, we were creating multiple experiences from the same content repository. So using React and using Drupal um, as a headless CMS was definitely the right thing for us to do. Um, but actually, when you really look at the whole project, including that website, which is Drupal backend, Drupal front end, completely integrated, the whole project probably should have been headless. So we kind of we forced that Drupal front end to do things that it probably wasn't necessarily meant to do, and it would have just been a lot easier on us and a lot more flexible if we decide to decouple the whole project. Um, I said that React was the right choice for us. Uh, it was. React was a great choice. But we built, uh, we built both of our apps without any state management. So for those of you who know React, uh, you know that just having this state floating around is probably going to cause you some problems down the line. Um, and it did. It did cause us quite a few problems, actually. Um, so I think in our situation, the, the decision to have state management tooling was just made a little bit too late. We didn't have time to implement it. Um, so if you are doing this and if you are choosing your technologies, make sure you've got the expertise there to know that you are doing it in the right way that's actually going to be 
easy and straightforward for you because that's the whole point of doing this. It's supposed to be something that is flexible and adaptable. Um, okay, I've put this point down here. Um, clear separation of concerns. So um, if we were thinking about um, kind of not going down this monolithic CMS route, so not having a Drupal back end, Drupal front end or, or WordPress or another CMS, um, we need to think about which end is doing which. Because if we've got a monolithic build, well, they're all kind of working together. Okay, so we don't have to actually separate out that much. But when I've got a headless CMS and then I've got a React app on the front, I need to know which is doing which, so I know what to tell it to do. Um, so for us, we, we came a cropper a little bit with this. So we had an issue with our price calculation for the QuickBook app. So our back end, it had the price per, uh, price per hour for these rooms. Our React app had the duration. And so we were kind of thinking like, oh, OK, where does this logic actually happen? Where do we make the calculation? This is something which kind of slowed us down a little bit as we made that decision and then implemented it. It's definitely something that could have been um, avoided had we thought about that a little bit earlier. Um, that situation is, in reality, not quite as simple as I've perhaps suggested. Um, so we, in this project, we didn't just have React app sitting with a headless Drupal uh, CMS. We actually had a React app sitting with a headless CMS, which was then connected to a third party CRM. So whenever we were making calls, we were thinking about the API call going to Drupal. Maybe it'll come straight back if the data was in the CMS. If not, Drupal would then call the CRM, it would get the data back, it would send it back to the, the React app. Um, so it's a bit more of a complicated structure in terms of separation of concerns. We've got now different things to think about. Um, but actually, thinking about those apps in kind of a, that more complicated sense, what it really reinforces, actually, that when you have a clear separation of concerns, it's fantastic. Because we did have quite a complex structure on the back of ours, and it was pretty difficult to work with. But actually, by decoupling and by having those React, uh, React front ends completely unaware of what was going on, it allowed us to really leverage all that data without having that cognitive load. So they were lightweight, they were fast, um, and that is because they were decoupled. It was a fantastic thing. OK, final points. Uh, this is the one that I probably labor most heavily. I think this is super, super important if you are going down this route and trying to make something extensible and flexible. Um, and that is to have a clean and consistent API design. So the point of this is extensibility. Um, so keep your API clean and document it meticulously. Um, so our API ended up being a bit more custom than it did being RESTful, um, which kind of means that we really need to document it um, pretty well so we know that actually what's happening there. We didn't document it quite as well as we needed to. Um, and all this really means for us, uh, it's just implications in terms of time now. So in the future, when we go to extend this even further, we're going to have to just do a little bit of legwork uh, working with those API endpoints. So we're going to have to figure them out, essentially, work out what does what, what data we're going to get, what data we need to give. So the final bit of advice that I'd give you is that if you are going down this route of having a headless CMS so that you can extend it in multiple frameworks on the front end, um, Invest time in your API design, because that is the part, if there's any of all of these, that's going to prevent you from making this extensible and easy to work with. OK. Um, have we got any time for questions? <laughs> <laughs>